Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, for joining us in this COVID-19 free environment. Um, I'm Alexandra Carvalho, and with my teammate, Mike Barkley, we are the Atlanta chapter. Um, so our project was Empower Clarkston, and we did it with uh, Friends of Refugees. So today we're going to speak a little bit on our project partner, the community partners, the scope of the project overall, our implementation plan results and highlights, and then team recommendations that we made. So as I said, our project partner was Friends of Refugees. They are located in Clarkston, Georgia, here right outside, out, right outside of Atlanta. Um, a couple things they do is they do well-being for refugees, education, and employment. And our point of contact was Brian Bollinger there. He's the executive director. So just to kind of give you guys a bigger picture of refugees, um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees states that the definition is a person's crossing international borders because they're fleeing armed conflict or persecution. So uh, worldwide, 70.8 million have had to flee their homes. About 25.9 have registered as actual refugees. Um, and then about 92,000 have actually been resettled to a third country as a refugee and they've gone through the entire process. So the entire process takes an average of seven years. So it can be anywhere from uh, three to four up to 15. So it just kind of depends. So a lot of these families actually spend their entire lives. A lot of these children spend a lot of their child, childhoods in refugee camps. Um, once a refugee or a family is connected with the United States, um, the UNHCR then goes through about a 10, 10 to 12 month process and then after that, once that process has been approved, then the U.S. has an additional vetting process of 18 to 24 months. So once a refugee has gone through that entire process and they're finally able to come here to the U.S., um, they do come as a permanent resident of the U.S. And then at that point, they have five years after they arrive to decide whether they want to become citizens or not. They do have to repay back their plane ticket. So the plane ticket is purchased for them, but they do have to repay that back within six months of arriving to the U.S and it has to be um, within four years total. And then every refugee who enters, they receive $925, uh, which is a gift, it's not a loan, so they don't have to pay that back, but they are, are expected to use a, that 925 to um, get them through for 90 days. So a couple expectations for refugees when they arrive here um, is they have to get a full-time job within 90 days to be able to start providing support for them and their families. And then that's kind of what brings us into our partner and Friends of Refugees and what they do in the whole Empower Clarkson project. It's really based off of um, employment and education and the well-being of refugees and citizens within Clarkson. So along with the community partners, Lifecycle Building Center, Greenlink, City of Clarkson, and South Face, um, it has turned into uh, the Empower Clarkson project is part of a general construction training program. So it does allow training opportunities for some of these refugees and other citizens in Clarkson to learn how to retro retrofit and weatherize um, homes. And then from there, um, that also allows some of the citizens refugees to receive weatherization and retrofitting of their homes. So overall, this is gonna help reduce environmental impact. It's gonna increase financial security of the workers, and it's gonna allow job placement for these individuals. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael Barkley so he can explain um, the rest of the project. Thanks, Alexander. So uh, I'm gonna get into the details. <clears throat> you know, Empowering Clarkston, the whole idea is to uh, create some green jobs. And then once they go through the training, 80% of the, the trainees will receive some type of placement, job placement for the, in the first 90 days. <laughs> Now what happens is we're actually growing skilled workers in that environment. So each cycle uh, will have 15 trainees and there'll be two cycles per year. So one in the fall and one in the spring. Along with uh, also what's happening during that cycle is the, after they're trained, they'll be going out to homes in the community, in the Clarkson community and completing that uh, retrofitting, uh, the weatherization and any small uh, renovation things that need to be done. The goal is to do 12 homes each cycle, so that will be 24 homes a year. Next slide, please. Now the implementation uh, phase, our plan consisted of five phases. Uh, the first phase was co-design and recruitment. 
Second phase is screening and the actual classroom training. Phase three was the uh, field training part one and then data gathering and phase four and five was really the steel training and then finalizing the results just to make sure if this is a viable program to continue to do for years to come. Next slide, please. Now, uh, our cohort, we were charged with uh, the awareness piece of the program, really getting the idea and the plan out to the community. Uh, so our goal was to commit, uh, complete some community flyers, uh, complete some social media posts, as well as design a PowerPoint presentation that uh, Brian could use to make people more aware of the program. So now our community flyers uh, were designed with, with three specific purposes. One was to recruit trainees. The next one was to really uh, speak to the residents that may have opportunities and need some repairs done in their home. And then the third one was to seek people that could refer those type of individuals to us. Now there were some other things we had to take in consideration when designing these flyers is the, uh, the community that we were trying to reach out to. We really wanted to make sure it was written in a way to uh, or at a level to where no matter who read it in the community, they would understand what we were trying to offer. Now, as far as our social media post, uh, again, this was done in an effort to create awareness about the program, uh, really focusing on the residents uh, in the Clarkson community, as well as um, anybody that would be, could participate, uh, potentially be a trainee. Uh, so we use a normal, uh, we're gonna, our plan is to use a normal uh, social media uh, arenas and to include hashtags as, as well as dates, times, and places to where people could go and find out more about the program. And as far as the PowerPoint, uh, that was designed really explaining uh, the, the whole idea behind the program, the impact that it could have on the community. And as a matter of fact, Brian used that PowerPoint uh, in a presentation that he did with the city of Clarkson, and they, and they were really impressed with the idea of the program and what it could uh, do in the community. Now, our recommendations to Brian was to allow the next cohort to assist in the completion of the program. Uh, based on timing, we took it as far as we could. We got the basis done or the awareness piece of the whole program completed. And the next steps will be to continue on, uh, continue to roll it out and evolve and help with the uh, evolution of the pro program. Uh, at this point, um, I'd like to say it was great learning about uh, the Re Friends of Refugees, the Clarkson community. Uh, me being from Atlanta, I, I, I was unaware of what was going on in that community, so it was eye-opening for me. Um, and at this point, we would like to open it up for questions. Um, hi, guys. It's Jenna. Um, first of all, great to see you guys. I know it's not quite under uh, the circumstances we had hoped, but... Um, I just want to commend you guys on a job well done. Um, it's great to learn more about what your process was like. Um, I am wondering what you guys could identify as maybe some of the uh, highlights of this project and what you learned, um, as well as um, some of the challenges you faced. What made it difficult? So I can go ahead and start with that one. Um, I really enjoyed that we were paired with Friends of Refugees because I Prior to this project, I didn't understand really the definition of a refugee or any of the process of what they kind of went through to come here. So for me to find out that it's an average of seven years for a refugee to um, even kind of as soon as they kind of register to become a refugee to even get placed, that was, that was crazy for me. And to think that a child from the age of three to 18 could possibly have lived their entire life in a refugee camp was um, very eye-opening and just kind of learning the process and how much is involved behind it. Um, as far as challenges go, um, initially we had a little bit of an issue trying to reach out to our partner organization, but once we did kind of connect, connect with them, we were able to work with them and kind of come up with a plan. I think everything, I think once we were paired with them, everything was a little too early in their planning process, so they didn't quite have an idea as to what they wanted us to do. Um, so that kind of really came around about towards the end of January is when we we're really able to connect with them and have a clear picture of what to do going forward. So at that point, we we're kind of like, okay, it's almost, you know, we don't have, we only have about a month and a half at this point. So we need to try to knock out everything we can for you guys, you know, while we have the time. So I think that was the biggest challenge that we faced. 
Yeah, for me, it was the, um, the whole idea uh, where you're allowed to practice what you're learning uh, was, was what stood out to me. So being able to take a, what we've learned in the cohorts and apply it to an actual case, it just really drills down and, and, and uh, fine tunes or gives you, give you the ability to fine tune uh, what you learn and put it to, into practice. Uh, as far as the uh, opportunities um, or challenges, you know, when I, when I think about it, I think of one of Mike Tyson's saying, everybody has a plan until they get punched. So uh, I started off this, this journey, you know, living in Warner Robins, Georgia, and now I'm in Eastern Pennsylvania. <laughs> so for me, it was a, a huge, a lot going on during the time and really having that ability to stay connected with uh, uh, with my cohort was not uh, at the level that I would like it to have been. So it, uh, it created a, probably a little bit more stress for me through the process of really trying to make sure that I was adding value and not just kind of riding along. I hope that would be my biggest opportunity or challenge. I think overall we both would have liked to, I think all of us would have liked to have connected a little bit more um, in person kind of do some things that way rather than over the phone or over, you know, video and everything. But I think, you know, even with you being there, it, it really wasn't any difference for us. Um, and I think we worked that out very well. Hi, everybody. This is Heather. I'll jump in. Um, I couldn't get my computer to go off mute, so I uh, apologize for the long time there. Um, thanks for the, the work that you've done on this, and uh, Mike, for your vulnerability of talking through the challenges that you faced personally through this. And you touched a little bit on how, Mike, you said how much you appreciated being able to, to put into practice on this project, what you've been learning. And I would love to hear from you two things. Um, first of all, what from the learning, from the curriculum in the program, you felt you felt to be most valuable? And then secondly, what else could there have been? What was missing or would you have liked to have access to or to have learned that would have improved your experience with this project? I'll say that the, the two things that um, I really enjoyed was the importance of self-care. Um, that helped a lot during those stressful times is really to being able to say, okay, you got a lot to do, you got a lot going on, take a step back, relax for a second, get your thoughts together, and then reapproach the situation. And then also um, the bias training. Uh, you know, the part of my uh, responsibility in preparing for uh, this evolution with uh, Friends of Refugees was to uh, work with the team or the company that was going to provide the training for the refugees. And um, so I jumped in the plane, flew down to Atlanta, uh, spent the day, uh, spent the night, I remember, came down the day before, spent the night and got up early in the morning and spent the rest of the day with, the, with that team. And walking into that, I really didn't know what to expect, uh, but that, that training opened my brain to, or opened my mind to saying, hey, let's stay open, let's see what's happening. And there was probably situations where I would have interjected before that training and, and maybe said something too early, that I, it, it caused me to pause for a second and then really pay attention to what was going on and ask some questions around uh, the situations. And it ended up being okay. It ended up being, or I, by doing it that way, I found out that uh, my initial perception uh, was incorrect. Uh, the team, that company was completely bought into the process and what they needed to do to help that community, even though it didn't feel that way at the beginning. Uh, as far as things I would have liked to see, and this is something that came up early on um, in Dallas, was, was the ability to, uh, well, let me say this, a lot of people don't have a feedback tool, a way to provide feed constructive criticism to somebody to where uh, they can make adjustments on the fly. And I think that would be something that if we can add that early on in the process, it would help a lot of people through the process uh, because we'll know how to say, pull somebody aside and say, hey, when you did this, it made me feel this way. And, and they can have some conversations around it to where we can walk away with some good learnings uh, throughout the whole process.
Alexandra, what about you? Would you like to answer that question as well? Interested to see. And if not, it's all it's right too. No, that's fine. Um, I do want to touch on the self-care part that Mike said that that really I feel like made a bigger difference than I expected that it would have, just kind of learning about that. Um, and I feel like learning that early on was very helpful, um, both personally and I had a lot going on kind of more de November, December, and um, some, of the, some of the SLC stuff ended up being pushed to the back burner, you know, and just doing self-care and being able to focus on that and being able to kind of um, bring everything, you know, just remembering, just doing little self-care things here and there and remembering, okay, you know, this is, all this stuff is coming together at one time and it's very challenging, but it's all temporary. So, you know, work through it and, and, you know, focus on everything. And so I was able to kind of refocus on SLC back in January. So that was good to do. And um, so that was really important. I'm glad that we had that early on. I think that is a good tool, Mike, for you to say, for you to mention that being able to, if we had had earlier on being able to give, provide criticism in a, I guess, more productive way, um, that would have been beneficial. I think there are some items that we learned in Atlanta, um, maybe as far as the allied ship and affinity, kind of learning more about that earlier on when we were getting ready to partner with our organizations. I think that would have been beneficial as well because then it would have helped us kind of um, maybe approach everything a little differently and maybe a little bit more with eyes open and kind of being more aware of whether it was allied ship or it, whether it was affinity that we were kind of relating to our organizations with. I think that would have helped um, as well. And then I think um, early on in the, in the cohort, um, I know my, my, I myself was a little confused as to kind of the project and what was to be expected. And um, so I think that that could be communicated earlier on as well. I think that would be helpful. I know that was communicated early on, but I'm, um, I guess in regards to kind of a bigger picture of what we would be expected to do throughout the entire process, um, I think that would be beneficial, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's totally understandable. Taking notes over here. Appreciate that feedback. And the, 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 the critique stuff, that's a really good suggestion. I've had that training in a couple of other leadership programs and it really is valuable. Um, I'm glad you guys brought that up. It's, it's something we could definitely do. I think there are also a lot of things that we had learned about that um, I'm already automatically applying in everyday things. And so I'm not uh, quite aware of it. So like Mike, you had mentioned listening and I was like, oh yeah, after we did that, you know, I tried to become a much better listener and just sit back and listen rather than making sure to, you know, say okay or say something or ask a question too early, just kind of give a little bit more time to let someone speak and just to see how that could take us a whole different direction than what I had thought it was going to be or what it would have on how to ask questions too early. Um, so it's really interesting just to kind of walk around every day and think about it and be like, oh yeah, this was something that I learned in SLC. So, so I'm sure there's many more examples we could provide. I just can't, can't identify them right now. So um, I have a question. First of all, thank you both for a great presentation and for the commitment you've made to the program. Um, and for the feedback you're giving us here today, it's incredibly helpful. And um, I, I guarantee it will be, it'll be incorporated into our program as we go forward. Um, I, like, I, I like hearing when these projects, what people are learning and how it's kind of um, opened up their um, awareness of other communities within their communities. I think that that's one of the real benefits of, of doing community work is you kind of realize, wow, there's a lot more that goes on and there are people in this community that I just wasn't even aware of. Um, but what I want to, what I would like to understand or, or what you think that is the impact that you've left with, with them. Do, do you feel that, that there is work that you did, like, that this will be carried forward now that you aren't working with them anymore? I know you suggested that in the following cohort, maybe they continue the work, but do you feel like there are things that you did that they will continue to use regardless if the mission continues, goes back and is with them or not, that they, they have some tools and some information that they didn't have before because of what you, the work you did? 
I would say uh, yes. I, I think more so than anything, you know, our commitment to uh, to try to help. Um, we stayed uh, relentless through the process of not knowing what was going on through a uh, staffing change that uh, Brian had. We started off working with Lauren. She accepted a position with another company, moved on, and we had to work directly with uh, Brian. There was a number of um, uh, hiccups throughout the process, but we we stayed in there and we kept trying to, to reach a, an understanding of how we could help and let them know that we wanted to help. And, uh, and he made comments uh, about it too on, on the cold calls that he really appreciated what we were doing and, uh, and how we were moving, trying to move forward. Yeah, and I think, I think the items that we were able to assist him with, especially with Lauren kind of unexpectedly leaving, I think everyone was very excited for her to be moving on. Um, and it was a very good transition for her, but it did leave them short and she was our main point of contact for the project. So I think once she find, once she left, then Brian was like, actually, you know what, since she can't do these things, like if you guys could help out with the social media posts, the flyers, the, the presentation, um, the presentation that Mike had done, Brian actually used that to present to city leaders of the city of Clarkston. So I know that a lot of these items were very helpful um, in just kind of getting awareness of the project out there. I know that he originally wanted us to post post up the flyers, um, but he wasn't quite able to kind of, he wasn't able to get the flyers and everything approved with the other community partners in time. I know he had a list of addresses he wanted um, myself to go and post up flyers around. So that's something that I probably will still help him with. Um, once he's able to kind of get that taken care of, is ready for it. I'll see if I can grab maybe a few other people uh, a few other veterans and just kind of go around city Clarkson and post up the flyers for them. Um, so I know that as far as those items that definitely help them and that's going to be, I mean, those will be part of the project going forward, those flyers and the social media posts. I know that they'll continue to use those. And just kind of on another note, as far as learning Atlanta, um, I moved to Atlanta about a year and a half ago. So here, the communities, I mean, I came from Ohio before here in North Carolina before that, California before that. So I moved all around. Uh, so Georgia was an entirely new state for me. And so being part of this process absolutely helped me learn more about here, like the city of Atlanta. And um, I, I mean, I didn't know anything. Not only did I not really know anything about refugees before, but I didn't know that the large refugee population in Georgia is here in Clarkson in our like back door. So it was really thankful that we were able to be paired with Friends of Refugees. And then even with everyone coming here to Atlanta, going through the online, you know, learning of the city of Atlanta and the whole west side and, and the, the areas over there, that's, you know, I had been to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium before and I had walked right by these areas and had not understood anything about them or the history behind them and kind of anything about it. So that was really eye-opening to me. So. I'm excited to, we'll be here maybe about another year and then who knows what will be next. Um, so I'm excited to use the things that we learned at SLC to towards my next community and try to help make an impact there and learn about it faster and sooner and get involved with the platoon there. Hopefully there is one um, and then start making an impact. If not, you can always start one. I've seen that too. <laughs> if there's one there, that'd be easier since I'd be new to it. But if not, take a look at starting platoon there. I've got good points of contact to reach out to if needed. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I wanted to just really uh, express a gratitude real quick because you guys have in a cohort that's faced a lot of the adversity. You guys as a team and individually both faced some adversity throughout the program and really fought hard to put this thing together for us. Uh, I really, really appreciate the work you all did. Uh, I wish I'd gotten to spend a little more time with you each individually, but uh, uh, we've still got plenty of time for that moving forward now that you guys are alumni. So excited to, to see that and do that with you all. Absolutely, same here as well, Matt. And we really appreciate everything that you guys have all taught us and um, you know everything that you guys have done to try to make SLC the best experience and to get us to learn the most that we absolutely could from this cohort. So I really appreciate everything that you guys have done and all the hard work that you guys have put in, especially behind the scenes. I know there's a lot to it. So 
Thank you all. Yeah, I did all that. Uh, it's, it's been a, a pleasure. And, you know, as I continue to move around the United States, I will stay engaged and, and uh, pine platoons everywhere I go. I've already Thanks. had an opportunity to go up to New Jersey and uh, participate with them uh, a couple weekends ago. So. Awesome. Well, you're consistently getting closer to Pittsburgh, Mike, so you're making the right move. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I don't know if I can get much. Nah, I guess I could probably get too much further away, but all future options are probably closer to Pittsburgh also. <laughs> 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 and I know that's something working with Friends of Refugees, too, and learning about the volunteer opportunities that they have, um, this civilian side with the nonprofit that I work, um, the Warrior Alliance, um, I've been able to get volunteer opportunities out there to the veterans that we work with. Um, so I know that that'll help make a lasting impact as well and hopefully help bridge that connection between the Warrior Alliance once I end up moving to the next place and Friends of Refugees and helping support that. And I know Friends um, Brian reached out to us and, and had requested um, some assistance, some service project assistance with them. So we were able, I was connecting him directly to David Garcia and I think they're working on getting a project going for that. So that's exciting to see also. And I definitely am looking forward to taking, taking part in that one once it gets scheduled. Um, I just want to congratulate you both. I uh, sat with you when we were in Atlanta um, and I know especially uh, talking through the GROW model, I think it was just that week that your point of contact at the organization had changed. Um, suddenly you were kind of figuring out what to do and um, how to maximize your impact in the time you had left in the program. And, and it definitely seems like you guys found a good way to do that. So um, kudos to you. I know it, it wasn't easy. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's good to have you sitting with us. And um, I think that was definitely right after that was the turning point in our project. Um, because prior to that, you know, as we were sitting there doing the GROW model, we were like, okay, maybe we should present something to friends of refugees and say, hey, if you don't have anything for us, how about, you know, what if we can do this? And so we kind of come up with a plan to present to them just in case they still don't have anything for us. And then it turned out when we reached back out to them, that's when, our, that's when everything had shifted from Lauren to Brian. And he's like, actually, I could use you with help with all these items. So <laughs> that well, but the GROW model definitely did help us kind of work through that challenge and figure out how to move forward with it. That's awesome. All right, any more questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you both for putting together this nice presentation and for your hard work these past couple months. Um, it has been challenging. And Mike, I like how you keep using the word opportunity in place of challenge. I think I'm going to mm -hmm. take that from, <laughs> from you. Um, it's been really exciting to see your team work through this um, in such an impactful organization. Um, yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. So great job to you both. Um, and yeah, you're alumni now. So continue to look out for all the events that are that are on the horizon um, when we're able to gather in person again. Um, but yeah, so you'll be hearing from our alumni people very shortly. Um, but you know, you can always reach out to us for resources, questions, assistance, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, and I've still got some work with you, Alexandria, on your uh, professional development grant. Mike, yours is already in and submitted and everything. We're working on that side of things. So just, I'll be in touch with both of you guys separately about that as well. Great, thanks. Sounds good, Matt. And I do have a question for you guys. As far as alumni, what kind of opportunities are there or is there any kind of, um, is there anything that kind of keeps alumni connected moving forward? Which, what smiling face wants to take that? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we are standing up our new alumni branch. Um, and right now there's a, there's a Facebook page. That's the easiest way to connect. Um, and you should all be getting an invite soon. Um, but the opportunities that exist are, you know, the service projects, certainly the platoon events. Um, but there's also other, other events specifically for alumni. Um, you know, we call alumni back for panelists, as you've seen during, the, during this. Um, I, I think WVLP may tap into some alumni in the future. 
Um, when we gather in cities, we'll be inviting alumni that are local to join us for um, for service projects we have directed towards the programs or for dinners or whatnot. Um, and then there will be more opportunities as the as that team sort of develops their their scope and their role. As, as Jane said, standing up. Uh, Oh, go ahead, Susan. Sorry. No, As ahead. Jim was saying, we have a director of, of alumni, relatively new position. So she's in a series of doing town halls, um, have been in person moving to virtual with alumni from around the country and, and getting some um, feedback from them and input from them of ways that we can continue to engage alumni um, in, in a variety of ways. So we absolutely would, she's gonna, we're gonna have, she's gonna be putting out information to the cohort so that um, you have a better idea um, kind of of what she's thinking, where she's going and what opportunities are currently available. But it's definitely an initiative that we're working on as an organization because we know there are so there are thousands of them out there and we wanna make sure that they, we continue to provide opportunities for them to, um, to continue their service and to be an asset to one another and to their communities. Now, as far as I know, both Mike and I have moves in our future, where we'll probably be going to different states. Um, is there any way to kind of keep that updated with you guys? That way, you know, those local events are actually still local to us. A database that there's, you know, alumni information kept at. For the time being, what I would tell you guys, and because the one thing that's always existed and will continue to exist either way is the, the veteran mafia and the kind of the weird form that it always has here uh, with our network, kind of the unofficial alumni network. Uh, and I'm already that for you guys. Jimmy's that as well. Jimmy's alumni. Uh, so any in the meantime, until Talisa reaches out to you, which should be soon anyway, uh, if you have any updates or any problems, you can let us know. I'm, uh, part of that network and I'll always make sure that you're getting whatever information I've gotten and it, it happens in weird way you guys know some of this stuff and when we got somebody needs something down in Atlanta you'll be on my call list uh, Alexandra you know the call and say hey do you know anybody that has resources or then what we got to help these people what, what can we do uh, that network just kind of self-activates in a lot of weird ways but aside from everything that Talise is doing to, to formalize this thing so that already exists and you guys are essentially a part of that right away so if you move let somebody know let me know and we'll get you updated in the system until there's a formal way to do it Absolutely. And you guys are lucky to have um, David, who's down here in the land. But if you guys have anyone that needs any kind of resource, definitely you know, reach out to myself as well. And we can probably get you connected with the right organization. I'd also say like when you get our newsletters and stuff, you can also respond to those if you ever need to update like your contact info. So if we start giving you info about the wrong, like if you see local stuff coming, um, actually, a big project we're working on is updating our whole system so people can have profiles where you can actually go in and update and have like a profile with TNC so we know where to send you local info, info from. Um, so that'll constantly, but anytime you get a newsletter, you can always respond to it actually. Somebody will actually see it on the opposite side. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Jenna. Okay, last minute questions, comments? All right, well, Michael and Alexandria, thank you very much for putting this together. Please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions um, in the future. And I look forward to, to seeing what you two um, you know, produce in your own nonprofits and your own space. And hopefully we can see you at, at another event in the future. Great. Thanks yes. a lot. Thank you. Thank you guys. And thanks for the time. Appreciate it. I know it's a lot of time Certainly. for different groups. So sure. we look forward to seeing yeah. you guys at some point in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you. Great job, you guys. Thanks. Right, thanks. You guys Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Happy Friday. Thanks. You too.